Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, Passive Trapping and Surveillance of New World Screwworm. Before we begin, please ensure you've opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted at this time. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of today's presentation, and you'll be given the instructions on how to ask a verbal question at that time. You are, however, welcome to submit written questions throughout the presentation. To submit your questions in writing, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. Should you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. And with that, I'll turn things over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Greetings, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I'd also like to welcome you to our Rubber Meets the Road webinar today. The webinar on passive trapping and surveillance of New World Screwworm will be presented by Dr. Sean Bolton. Dr. Bolton began his career with USDA APHIS Veterinary Services in 2004 as a field veterinary medical officer in western Tennessee. He obtained his veterinary degree from Auburn University College of Veterinary Medicine in 1990 and is also a 1995 graduate of the Swine Executive Program in Health Management from Iowa State and the University of Illinois. His 14 years in private practice were exclusively dedicated to food animal health and disease eradication in modern swine production systems. As a result of the 2016-2017 New World Screwworm outbreak in Florida, Dr. Bolton has developed a particular interest in screwworm-related training, preparedness, and response. He has deployed to disease incidents in numerous states, including TB, LPAI, HPAI, New World Screwworm, Texas Cattle Fever Tick, CWD, and Newcastle. He currently serves as the Operations Section Chief for the VF Red National Incident Management Team. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Dr. Bolton. Thank you, Liz. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the uh, presentation today is uh, going to be a, re a review of the uh, grassroots project for uh, fiscal year 2019 through the Vision and Science Program, uh, which was centered around uh, the topic of uh, response, preparedness activities, in particular uh, focusing on uh, developing passive trapping for uh, New World Screwworm uh, as a response tool. Uh, first, I just want to start off by thanking the grassroots program for um, approving this project and uh, I just wanted to remind everyone uh, about the grassroots program. Uh, there are funding, uh, there's funding available uh, if you have uh, a project, an idea, thought process uh, that, that you think uh, may align with the Veterinary Services New Perspective Plan. Uh, I would encourage you to give you uh, to give that some thought. Uh, this particular project, um, as you can see on the slide, the five goals of, of the VS New Perspective uh, Plan: transform the culture of VS, build new collaborations, optimize animal health competencies, support readiness and response, and invest in technical infrastructure. Felt like that uh, this project in particular uh, address the uh, goals number two, three, and four, and especially uh, supporting readiness and response. Um, the uh, Florida incident um, certainly uh, brought to uh, the forefront of our minds uh, the fact that in the 50 years or so since New World Screw Room had been eradicated from the United States, uh, that we had lost a lot of our competency uh, in dealing with that and the Florida incident um, certainly brought that back to the forefront. Very steep learning curve that we had to go through uh, during the beginning of that incident. And certainly uh, having uh, APHIS International Services, their expertise, uh, as well as um, the uh, COPEG uh, sterile insect facility in Panama, uh, supporting our eradication efforts uh, were essential in, in helping us to be successful. The grassroots program um, in recent years has been uh, particularly supportive of projects that uh, are centered around uh, New World Screwworm Preparedness and Response. Uh, in 2018, a project uh, submitted by Denise Bonilla and Julie Godier uh, testing a sticky trap in the Florida Keys, uh, followed by 2019, uh, another project uh, 
that uh, Denise Bonilla submitted uh, an ectoparasite roadshow that uh, centered around one day uh, focused on new oil screwworm and, and one day focused on uh, ticks, uh, especially cattle fever tick and Asian longhorn tick. And that project has been renewed again for 2020. Uh, and uh, 2019, we did uh, uh, training in District 1. And then uh, the option uh, in 2020 is available for Districts 2, 3, and 4. Um, my project, uh, the passive traffic project that I'll detail for you today, uh, was approved by the Grassroots Committee for 2019. And then uh, for this fiscal year, uh, thank you again to the Grassroots Committee for uh, approving a project that I submitted that's going to center around uh, sterile insect technique and especially aerial dispersal, uh, which I'll be working on um, in the coming months. Recent confirmations of new oil screwworm, uh, of course, in 2016-17 in, in the Florida Keys, uh, in addition to um, a local area of infestation on the mainland in the Homestead, Florida area. Um, and as you all know, uh, that was successfully eradicated uh, in uh, the spring of 2017 at a cost of about $3.2 million. Uh, shortly thereafter, within within a two-year span of time, new oil screwworm was again confirmed in Florida, uh, associated with uh, an imported dog from Venezuela. Uh, this particular um, confirmation was limited uh, and an established uh, population um, was was not uh, established, so uh, it was very limited, and, and as a result, we didn't have to respond to that. But it brings to mind that um, the probability uh, of a new oil screwworm introduction occurring again in the future uh, is somewhat high. If you look at this particular slide showing the last 40 years or so, you can see that we have had um, 29 introductions uh, of new oil screwworm in the United States. Um, you know, on average, every two years, two to three years, uh, in some cases. Uh, 97 through 2000, and as an example, we've had one uh, each of those four years. The uh, 2018 confirmation in, in Florida on the Venezuelan dog is not reflected on that slide, but it, it brings to mind that we need to be um, prepared. Uh, we need to keep uh, some of the knowledge that we've gained in the last few years um, through the eradication effort in Florida uh, fresh in our minds. We continue to train our people uh, to be able to respond because as, as we look at um, risk, uh, Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic are infested and close. Uh, numerous Caribbean islands are still infested as well as the entire continent of South America. So with the, um, the ease of travel and um, with um, potentially uh, bringing in screwworm through um, illegal introductions of people or animals into our country. Um, certainly the uh, probability is there that we may face this again and again. Uh, just briefly on the, on the screwworm life cycle to, to refresh your memory if you're, if you're not familiar with. Um, the fly is Cochleomyia omnivorax. As uh, you can see, the, the adult female um, will lay eggs after mating. Uh, those eggs will mature and hatch in about 24 hours. Then following that, there are three uh, larval phases, first, second, and third instar, which takes another five to seven days. Uh, after the third instar larvae uh, mature, uh, they will drop off the wound of the animal, which they fed on for the previous several days. Uh, and burrow into the soil where they pupate. And then that particular phase can be variable depending upon uh, temperature. Uh, they will emerge from uh, the pupil stage, uh, mature as adults over the next couple of days, mate, and then the life cycle uh, will start again with those um, mated females searching for 
uh, fresh wounds and animals uh, to deposit their eggs and, and the life cycle begins again. During the Florida incident, um, for, for the first time, uh, those of us that were involved in the response were exposed to surveillance methods for New World screwworm. Uh, first and foremost, uh, and, and by far uh, the most reliable and uh, the most valued method of surveillance is animal inspections and investigations. Having people looking at their animals, observing wounds, uh, detecting myases, uh, having, uh, submitting larval samples um, is, is the primary and most valuable means of surveillance. But in addition to that, there are trapping methods. Um, in the Florida incident, the uh, acting trapped uh, method that, that I call the gold standard, that's my, my terminology, is simply for a field technician uh, that has experience um, dealing firsthand with new oil screwworm, uh, using rotted beef liver as a bait uh, to observe uh, that liver on a plate with a fly net in hand and when a screwworm fly is observed, catching that fly and submitting it for confirmation. So that's kind of a very basic method, but that is the method that was utilized uh, during the Florida incident. It's very specific, it's very sensitive, works very well, uh, but it does require a highly skilled uh, technician that uh, is experienced in this area uh, to do that. At that time, we had no one in DF that had any experience uh, with that type of surveillance. Uh, fortunately, um, through the support that we got from APHIS International Services, as well as uh, the, uh, the COPEG uh, facility and technicians uh, from the plant in Panama were flown in, uh, to provide that needed expertise. In addition to that, uh, passive trapping uh, can be utilized. It was not utilized during the Florida incident, and that's something that um, I developed an interest in. But there are sticky traps, which I'll show you. There's a trap called the Bishop Trap, um, and these traps were baited with uh, beef liver or a, a chemical uh, component which has been given the uh, name swarm lure, uh, which are highly attractive to cochlear species as well as many other species of blowflies. Uh, typically in the Florida incident, our, our surveillance was uh, to, uh, to go to each GPS location, uh, conduct surveillance for a one hour increment of time, uh, targeting vegetative habitat, uh, which is highly attractive to, uh, to these flies and set up um, where the scent plume from the liver or the swarm lure uh, travels downwind into that area of habitat and draws uh, the flies. Record keeping is, is extremely important in, in each of those sites for that one hour uh, span of time. We record uh, GPS location, time, date, temperature, wind speed and direction, and uh, an assessment of fly activity. Uh, flies that are captured are uh, submitted to lab for identification and or uh, dissection, and I'll show you some of that in a later slide. So when you look at the fraud incident and um, you, um, you, you can see, not very clearly, but in the uh, Florida Keys and this sort of in that central southern section, you, you see a, um, what, what was the infested zone during the incident, which is surrounded by the, the red line. And then, in a, so that was the infested zone where we did the sterile insect release and also did a lot of surveillance in that area to uh, gauge the distribution of sterile flies. Then on the, uh, the left of the um, infested zone in the southern area was our southern surveillance zone. Then we also had a northern surveillance zone, which extended uh, up toward the mainland all the way to Key Largo. And then if you look on the very tip of the southern mainland peninsula of the state of Florida, you'll see a cluster uh, there, which represents uh, the 
surveillance and sterile insect release that was done uh, around the Homestead, Florida area uh, where there was one confirmation of screwworm uh, in a dog in January 2017. So uh, surveillance activities were um, conducted throughout the incident and uh, from that, uh, again, utilizing that gold standard technique and utilizing uh, technicians that were brought in from Panama to do so, felt that um, two things actually. One is we need to develop competencies in our own people to be able to conduct this type of surveillance. And secondly, uh, to look at passive trapping as a potential means to conduct this type of surveillance. Uh, so the gold standard technique, again, a trained technician using um, uh, liver as a bait and a net. Uh, you see depicted uh, in the picture on the left, that's Julie Godier. And um, so that, that individual would observe that plate of liver for an hour, and um, if a uh, screwworm fly was observed, catch it in the net. And that sounds real simple, but it's not. And um, and I'll show you some more pictures on that in, in a little bit later. On the right, uh, that's Carlos. He's one of the co technicians from Panama, and that is a uh, sticky trap that um, can be deployed. Um, and the, the uh, swarm lure chemical attractant is utilized. Uh, typically, those uh, traps are deployed for several days and observed. Uh, periodically and also uh, swarm lures uh, reapplied about uh, every three days or so. Now, the gold standard of the liver netting method. Um, when you look at these pictures, you can start to appreciate some of the difficulty that, that might be uh, encountered. One is uh, rotted liver is highly attractive to multiple species of flies. So when you've got a plate uh, covered in flies like that, uh, the, the task of uh, catching one of those uh, can be quite daunting. And so when you, when you do so, uh, then you end up with uh, a net that may have 20, 30, 40, 50 flies in it. How do you extract uh, that one fly out of the net? It takes a lot of experience. It takes a lot of training. Uh, it's uh, difficult to do. And currently, as a result of this incident and additional training, we have about five people in BS that uh, have the experience necessary to um, efficiently and effectively um, conduct surveillance by this method. So some of the um, some of the applications of surveillance, whether that be gold standard or that be uh, using passive traps, are to uh, determine the boundaries of the infested zone at the beginning uh, of an incident where a new well screwworm has been confirmed. Uh, again, animal inspections and investigations of myosis cases are extremely valuable uh, and are uh, a major part of the surveillance mechanism. Uh, at the beginning, throughout the incident, and after uh, the eradication. That activity has to continue uh, to document eradication. Additionally, inspection of animals that are uh, permitted movements uh, out of the infested zone. Uh, also, surveillance is conducted to determine the op optimal distribution of sterile insects, make sure that they, the infested zone is covered and also to uh, document the ratio uh, of sterile insects uh, that are released to um, the, the fertile uh, population in the infested zone. Also, surveillance is conducted uh, after the sterile insect release program is discontinued to document the absence of fertile New York screwworm. And then at the end of the incident, uh, there are periods of time in, in which you can be uh, declared technically free uh, and then again officially free after 6 and 12 months after the last detection of new wall screwworm. So surveillance activities are extremely important and they are consistently 
uh, in place from the beginning to long after um, the eradication is complete. So as I mentioned before, uh, through the Grassroots Program 2018 and a project submitted by Julie Govier and Denise Bonilla, uh, we tested a wind-oriented sticky trap, which is depicted in the picture on the left. It's simply a triangular-shaped uh, piece of um, fiberboard, uh, and on that uh, trap is a, uh, a couple of tubes, one on each side, um, clear plastic tubes that have a cotton wick uh, inside. So that cotton wick is saturated with swarm lure, which is a combination of several chemicals, uh, and then a sticky coating uh, is supplied to the surface of that trap. Uh, it's suspended from a uh, tree limb, um, and then a weight is placed on the bottom of the trap, and and its connection points uh, at the top and the bottom of that trap are fishing swivels. So that trap can rotate and orient itself uh, with as the wind direction changes and the plume of the swarm lure attractant um, as it travels downwind into an area of habitat will attract flies. And if they come in and commit themselves, then they stick to the adhesive and they can be removed and submitted for confirmation. Uh, the picture there is uh, the team that went to Florida. We returned to the uh, infested zone. Um, uh, the, the several keys that were part of the infested zone during the Florida incident, we went back to most of the same sites uh, where we had uh, release chambers. Uh, that And so through this project, not only did we test the sticky trap, but we also collected uh, many samples uh, submitted those to NVSL and, and documented um, that uh, effective eradication uh, had been achieved uh, as this was about uh, uh, 16 months or so after uh, we were declared uh, free. That's myself, uh, Florida HD, Casey Mitchell, Julie Gaudier, uh, and Denise Benilla, who's our BS entomologist. Also on that team was Dr. Nelly Amador Jen from Florida Department of Agriculture, who actually took the picture. So, uh, sticky trap on the left, uh, showing um, flies that uh, that committed to the trap and were uh, captured in the adhesive. Uh, picture on the right, uh, showing the uh, tangle trap adhesive that is applied to the trap, and um, which. Uh, presents its own set of problems, and I'll show you that in a minute. But what we found um, with the uh, with this trap was that um, we did side-by-side -side comparisons using the gold standard technique. Uh, our impressions were that uh, liver uh, was highly more effective as an attractant, uh, and that the results that we obtained with the gold standard method of active trapping versus the sticky trap method of passive trapping, utilizing, again, those one-hour increments of time, which are critical, um, that uh, the sticky trap uh, was clearly not as effective. Uh, after uh, Fly samples are obtained uh, regardless of what method of trapping is used uh, in an incident, especially when uh, sterile insect release is, is being uh, deployed at the same time that uh, screwworm flies that are identified have to be dissected to determine whether they are sterile flies that we've released as part of the eradication effort or if they are naturally occurring fertile flies. And uh, that is done by dissecting the reproductive tract of females, uh, sterile females versus uh, fertile females. Um, the reproductive tracts are uh, obviously underdeveloped and sterile. And um, so that is a uh, an ongoing part of surveillance is that um, any cochlemia omnivore species that are uh, captured during surveillance have to be dissected to determine sterility versus fertility. Some of the lessons that we learned from the Sticky Trap Project in 2018, 
Again, uh, we felt that liver was a far superior attractant versus the corn lure. Um, the sticky trap capture rate uh, was less than the gold standard um, method of surveillance. One hour deployments for sticky trap weren't practical, uh, and that's probably a, a, an unfair parameter to apply to a sticky trap. Uh, sticky trap would be far more effective deployed for several days uh, as opposed to one hour. Um, harvested flies could not be submitted to NVSL, at least without further um, preparation. And what I mean by that is, is the flies that are harvested from a sticky trap are coated in the adhesive that is applied to the surface of the trap. So in order to um, get those flies to be quality samples to submit for identification, uh, they have to be um, submerged in various types of solvent in order to clean them up to the point uh, that they can be readily identified. So that's an issue. Um, once this project was complete, um, I left feeling that we didn't have the type of trap that we needed at least to accomplish surveillance in one hour increments as we had um, utilized as a standard operating procedure during the Florida eradication. So in my mind, we needed a short run or one hour, uh, a trap that was affected for a one hour run that, that would achieve a high capture rate of the targeted species. Felt that uh, liver was definitely the attractant that, that we needed to utilize. Uh, and so at the end of this project, uh, forefront in my, in my mind was that maybe there was a new trap that we needed to develop. So some of the goals for a new trap that I had was, <clears throat> number one, inexpensive and easy to build with readily available materials, meaning that um, regardless of where an infestation might occur within the U.S., uh, that you could um, go to Lowe's, Home Depot, hardware stores, and purchase the materials that you need to construct the trap on site. Trap needed to be highly attractive to copy my species. It needed to fit that one hour trap run um, SOP, uh, it, that it would be um, easily deployed uh, by responders. Uh, after minimal training, uh, and then that the uh, collection of flies from the trap also were, were easily uh, manageable by responders. And then, as, as is crucial in, in any kind of screwworm surveillance, uh, it needs to be wind oriented. Um, and in my mind, uh, at least what I had in mind was airflow dependent. Uh, with a very uh, point for the mission of the attractant. And so I, w I went to work shortly thereafter. This would have been in, in August uh, of 2018, um, trying to come up with some kind of trap that fit that criteria. I had in my mind at the beginning using uh, some type of plastic bottle uh, to produce a, a nearly disposable trap. And I started with a Gatorade bottle, and, and since, the, since the Florida incident kind of fueled this interest for me in the beginning, I decided to name it the Gator Trap. Um, so the first one uh, used uh, the same triangular um, wind-oriented uh, uh, fiberboard that basically was the foundation of the sticky trap. Uh, the bottle was placed uh, so that it would uh, hang from that triangle, which gave it the wind orientation. Uh, as, as the wind blew into an air intake on the trap, uh, a scent, the scent of the liver was emitted through a tube at the bottom. Flies would enter through that tube, which had a dome screen with a small hole in it. And the trap worked decent, uh, but it was very rudimentary. Uh, there's numerous things that I didn't like about it, uh, but it at least got me thinking about airflow and, and how that could work to, to draw flies to a, a trap similar to this. 
So uh, continue to to uh, think and, and work on um, this general philosophy about pasture trapping. And the, the Generation 2 gator trap, which you see depicted there, continued to use the, the wind directional hanger, which was uh, simply the same fiber board that we used for the sticky traps. Uh, and then I constructed a trap out of four inch PVC pipe uh, with a PVC cap on the bottom. Uh, it has an air intake and an exhaust, the exhaust being the red tube that you see there. The air intake is depicted on the right um, with a small tube in the bottom of it. So as air blows and the trap orients itself into the wind, uh, air is blown through of the inlet and, and positive air pressure builds within the trap, which has uh, liver and the cap on the bottom, and the scent is exhausted through the red tube, which is attracted to the flies and they enter through that tube. So uh, this slide, you can see the bait cap, which is on the bottom, liver placed into that bait cap, and then a close-up on the right of the, of the tube that the flies enter uh, has a dome screen with a small hole in it about the size of a pencil eraser. Flies will enter the trap um, through that, and they don't uh, they don't find find the way back out, even though they could. Um, Rarely have ever seen a fly leave the trap once it once it enters. So uh, another couple of pictures of the the generation two gator trap. Uh, you can see the uh, the exhaust tube. That is the sole uh, point at which the liver scent is emitted emitted from the trap. Flies uh, are attracted to it. Um, they enter the tube, uh, go through that small opening in the screen, and, and once inside their trap. Then on the right, you can see through the, um, the clear plastic that forms the uh, air inlet to the trap that, that uh, many flies. Um, and so what I found when I um, initially deployed this trap and started to test it was that it, that it worked very well as long as there uh, was some breeze uh, and you were in an area of habitat that, that had a decent population of flies. Just a couple, uh, another couple of pictures. Uh, uh, after the cap is removed from the bottom of the trap, which contains the liver bait, there's also a screen uh, that you can see there that, that keeps flies uh, from leaving the trap. Uh, once the flies are collected at the end of the one hour surveillance run, um, they have to be euthanized uh, and collected. And so the picture on the right actually uh, came from the sticky trap project. We, um, when, when we were trying to, to develop a method for removing adhesive from the flies, we, we tested several solvents, um, which you can see depicted there. There's fingernail polish, there's acetone, there's paint thinner. Uh, then there's a commercially available solvent called goof off that you see there, number one. And what we found, for whatever reason, um, is that that particular uh, solvent, the goof off, uh, which is uh, an adhesive remover, uh, did a really good job in remove, removing the adhesive, but it also uh, seemed to preserve the color of the flies very well. This is critically important when you, when you have to, uh, to identify and separate the flies by species after they're collected. Um, so I tried numerous uh, things in terms of uh, coming up with a good uh, way to euthanize flies in the trap, and uh, the goof off ended up being the the, the choice. Uh, it produces euthanasia uh, over a period of five to ten minutes. The flies uh, seem to um, uh, smoothly uh, succumb to the to the um, to the vapor that's produced, and um, most importantly, it preserves the color uh, and the, the phenotypic characteristics of the flies and allows for identification. So, uh, for euthanasia, uh, the liver bait cap is removed. A uh, small amount of the uh, goof off uh, solvent is placed into a, another cap placed on the trap, 
And after about five to ten minutes, uh, those flies can be easily collected uh, into a Ziploc bag and taken back to the lab for identification. Um, record keeping is extremely important um, for, I, I don't know exactly how many uh, locations this trap has been, been deployed. Um, but for each of those locations, I have uh, a GPS record and uh, also, at least in the beginning, uh, I sorted these flies by species onto a, a sheet of legal copy paper, separated the copy of my species, recorded temperature, humidity, wind direction, wind speed, uh, GPS location, date, and so on uh, as a record of each deployment of the trap. Um, Eventually, especially in the two trainings that we had, uh, we began to use this uh, new off-term fly assessment form, which uh, Julie Gaudier and Denise Benilla developed uh, after uh, the uh, uh, Florida incident. And for each of the deployments of the trap, so we got uh, good records uh, showing um, all of these fields uh, of information that are required. So, uh, Having, uh, having uh, come to an end point, at least uh, at that point, on, on a trap that I felt was uh, worth testing, uh, I wanted to conduct surveillance training and uh, expose uh, a uh, group of people to, uh, to utilize the passive trapping. Uh, we did a lot of things in addition to that, which I'll detail in a minute. But uh, some of the goals that we had were to create competency in our ag uh, state agriculture and, and BS employees and surveillance, uh, which ultimately would decrease our dependent upon um, COPEG, you know, the need to, to be able to bring up people from Panama to assist us in eradication, uh, which is still critically important, but we felt like uh, we could do um, much of the surveillance activities and response activities on our own. Uh, you know, whether or not these, these trained responders would be a, a foundation for a uh, surveillance response team, uh, and then validate passive trapping as a, as a teachable response tool. Uh, so we conducted two trainings. The first was in Florida. Uh, two days, uh, we, uh, as part of the classroom uh, portion of this, we uh, covered the Florida, the history of the Florida incident. We talked uh, Fly identification, we taught surveillance and site selection, we had trapping demonstrations, we uh, taught uh, management of sterile insect release ground release chambers that were utilized during the Florida incident. We exposed those uh, attendees to emergent rates cal uh, calculations and male female ratio determination, uh, which is part of managing sterile insect release. Uh, we did field work, and then on the second day, we had a simulated incident complete with an incident action plan, uh, team rosters, assignment of surveillance uh, activities by GPS location. Um, so I'll move through, because I know already I think our time is starting to get short. Uh, so lecture, uh, we had a uh, trap construction uh, phase to the training, and you can see uh, uh, Casey Mitchell, Fernando Algirre, Jacob Smithson, uh, did a lot of the trap construction for the for the Florida training. Those guys did a great job uh, managing logistics. We had field instruction um, where we had in, in the Florida training. I think we had six teams with about five people on each team. Uh, picture on the right is our ops brief at the beginning of the second day. We brought everybody in. We reviewed the incident action plan, the team rosters, the GPS assignments and dispatch those teams uh, to uh, conduct uh, passive trapping as well as uh, active trapping using the gold standard and, and doing a comparison of the results of the two. Afterwards, uh, after flies are collected from the trap, uh, euthanized uh, the class, uh, came back to the classroom in the lab, uh, taught the participants to separate uh, the, the cockpit species, uh, we looked at those um, uh, under a microscope and uh, pointed out uh, to the attendees the, the differences in uh, Cocoa Mycelaria, which is, is uh, readily abundant, in, especially in the
states in the southern states and kind of our test fly for uh, these exercises. But pointed out the, the phenotypic differences in uh, Massillaria versus Omnivorax. And um, then moving on, uh, there were some lessons learned from the Florida train. We had about 30 participants. Uh, we built four additional traps uh, for uh, this particular exercise. <clears throat> and I made a mistake in this and that the the PVC type that we use for our air inlet and uh, the um, of the exhaust from the trap, uh, the uh, PVC pipe that I utilized was one inch instead of one and a half. Um, and um, again, that was a mistake that I made, but the, the four traps that we constructed during the incident did not perform as well as the two original traps, which utilized a inch and a half diameter uh, entry and, and exit for the airflow. So that's a lesson learned. Um, the, the, the triangular uh, wind-oriented hanger presented some problems in training. Um, it uh, sometimes was uh, not as well understood as it needed to be. Um, the um, the wind speeds that we had during this it was very hot week, uh, 100 degrees, hadn't rained in 30 days, and we didn't have as much wind as we really would have hoped to have. So there was variables there. Uh, and then uh, the way this particular trap is deployed, which is the same for sticky traps, you got to have uh, in the in the habitat area that you want to conduct surveillance in, you need the right kind of tree or the right kind of tree land. You need uh, something in the right place to, to be able to hang a trap from. And so some of these variables uh, I wanted to, to eliminate. Some of the successes from the training was that we had uh, 30 responders that were proficiently trained in fly identification. Uh, they understood passive trapping, uh, and they were very eager to continue their education um, in the future on these topics. So once again, after lessons learned, I kind of came back and thought, now how can how can I eliminate some of these variables? And um, one of those was airflow. So I came up with the idea that uh, maybe fan power was the way to go. So I converted these traps uh, from using that triangular hanger that you saw uh, and using fan power instead. So uh, you know, the solution for anything you need is, is Amazon. So go to Amazon and find a small computer cooling fan and a USB battery pack that it runs off of for about 20 bucks. You can buy the fan and the, the USB battery pack. I changed the area and let I mounted the fan on the top of the, the trap that you can see depicted on the right. And so now uh, wind orientation is, is no longer necessary because the fan provides the airflow through the trap. Also constructed, uh, constructing a tripod using uh, three five-foot long pieces of one-inch PVC pipe filled holes in the end of it, ran a wire through it. And so now we've got a tripod that we can put anywhere we want it to be. We don't need tree limbs. Um, so we can, can deploy this trap in the exact location and in the exact height above the ground that it needs to be in order to track flies uh, efficiently. So there's some versatility to, to the new trap in that uh, we can, if, 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 the tree, if the tree limb exists in the right location, we can hang the trap in that method or we can deploy it uh, from the tripod. And so immediately I found in the, in the testing that I did that, it, that this third generation trap uh, worked extremely well. That computer cooling fan will, will run for 24 hours uh, on one charge of the battery pack. So that's good for several days um, before you have to recharge. Um, and then, so here's a short video uh, that I wanted to show you. Uh, it's about 30 seconds long. Uh, there's a little bit of audio uh, in it, but it, uh, it's not necessary. I don't know if that sound's going to come through or not. I think the only thing I say is that this, uh, this is 10 minutes after um, after I uh, started the fan on the trap. But 
Uh, it looks a little rough. This was the, the first deployment with, with the fan and the, the battery pack power, and there's a lot of wires and duct tape and things, but uh, I've cleaned that up since then. But this will give you um, some idea of uh, the attractiveness of this trap to flies. So here we go. You should be able to see flies entering the trap at this point. So, uh, in conclusion, you know, what did we accomplish uh, with this grassroots project in 2019? Uh, we now have in the states of Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia about 30 to 35 responders. Uh, some of those are Florida State Department of Agriculture field employees, and most of them are VS employees. Uh, we built relationships uh, with, with state departments of agriculture, uh, Florida A&M University, Auburn University. Um, I think we have validated uh, passive trapping as a response tool that's teachable. Um, We've built uh, what I think is the foundation for an effective surveillance response team uh, in the event that we might experience a future infestation of the oil screw worm. Additionally, some of the funding that, uh, that I received from grassroots, I used to buy uh, microscope. Uh, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we, uh, uh, that's always been a limiting factor for us. Uh, in training as well as during the Florida incident is that we would go to universities or mosquito control or somewhere and, and beg and borrow a microscope so that we could utilize those for identification. So I now have uh, two dissecting scopes, two compound scopes, uh, a couple of rechargeable battery powered scopes where you can actually uh, identify uh, flies, you know, in the field, um, capability exists to, to screenshot images, uh, store them on SD cards, email, you know, email images uh, to uh, NDSL or wherever uh, to, um, to at least uh, assist in tentative identification. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, I felt like this project uh, for the $8,000 worth of funding, uh, we did produce a lot of results. And we're looking forward to um, 2020 and um, continuing the progress in this area, and especially as it relates to uh, sterile insect technique and, and especially area, aerial dispersal, which we did not uh, have to uh, implement during the Florida incident, although we considered it. Uh, thanks. To many people, um, I'm not going to read the names, but you can see them there on the screen. Um, for all of your work and assistance, um, couldn't have done it without you. And um, looking forward to, to working again with a lot of the same people uh, in 2020. So, Liz, I'll turn it back over to you and be glad to take any questions. Okay. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, as we move into Q&A, please feel free to place yourselves in the question queue by dialing pound 2 on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted, at which point please state your name and question. You can also submit your questions in writing by using the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Just remember to select all panelists from the drop-down menu before submitting your question. We do have one question in the written queue. Um, it says, for dissection of the fly reproductive tracts, was this something your staff had to learn, or was there someone trained for this? I imagine you might need a, quite a steady hand. Yes. Uh, the, the dissection that, as far as the trainings uh, that we put on in Florida and Alabama, uh, dissection was a demonstration. We, we did not train uh, people to dissect uh, flies for fertility. There are two or three of us that, that gained that experience during the Florida incident, um, but it does uh, require experience training and it does require a steady hand as well. Hmm. 
have another question. Um, how long was the overall screw worm incident? Confirmation in Florida was September 30th, 2016. Um, declare, uh, Declaration of Freedom uh, was, I think, March 23rd of 2017. And uh, sterile insect release continued until the first week of May 2017. Okay. Um, the next question is, why did you only use a one-hour time frame on the sticky gate and gator traps? It would seem that once-a-day observation and collection from the traps should be compared to the one-hour gold standard method for efficiency and effectiveness. <clears throat> well, we used we used the we used the one-hour time period basically because that was the SOP for the incident. So as we as we looked at um, that particular project was twofold. One was to evaluate the trap. Secondly was to visit many sites that were part of the 2016-17 incident, conduct surveillance uh, with gold standard as well as the sticky trap to document um, continued uh, freedom from new oral screw worm. So uh, as I mentioned during the presentation, uh, you know, a one-hour deployment of sticky trap I don't think is a fair comparison. It's just what we did because we had something like 50 sites that we needed to um, visit over a three-day period of time. The next question is, do you anticipate some future trainings? Will the training be open to others outside of the southeast region? So uh, there, there's a couple of opportunities that uh, people can uh, be watchful for in terms of uh, new world screw worm training. One is uh, Denise Medea's uh, Ectoparasite Roadshow, which will be coming or be offered at least to Districts 2, 3, and 4 this year. Uh, dates and locations I don't think are finalized at this point. Uh, so that will be uh, one day of screw worm and one day of tick. Uh, additionally, for my 2020 project, um, and just getting started on that, but I am hopeful uh, to again have training in uh, Florida, more than likely Florida, and also um, a state in Southern District 4. That project is going to target the southern Gulf Coastal states because of the probability uh, of infestation is greatest there. And um, so those, those are two more uh, not yet determined, but probable uh, training will occur in those two areas. Okay, do we have any verbal questions in the queue? I'm not showing any questions at this time. Okay, we just got another one um, in the uh, chat box. When do you think this trap will be available for surveillance work in areas like Puerto Rico? Well, I, it's hard, you know, it's hard for me to answer that question. This is, uh, you know, is something that that's been developed through through the grassroots project. Uh, you know, this. this this webinar today is kind of the final step in that in that project. Uh, certainly, uh, something that that uh, is open to discussion, which would need to involve DS leadership um, and, and District One in Puerto Rico. But uh, um, I couldn't say that it's available at this time. But it could be if the um, if leadership deemed that it was, would be an appropriate step. Okay, does anyone else have any other questions? Once again, if you'd like to ask your question verbally, dial pound two on your telephone keypad, or you can submit your question in writing by using the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Just remember to select all panelists from the drop-down menu before submitting your question. Well, I don't see any further questions. 
Um, with that, I think we'll conclude the webinar for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Bolton again for this great presentation um, and thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, tomorrow, we're also hosting a webinar, webinar on implementing the Secure Beast Supply Plan by Danelle bickett weddell at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Um, if you're interested, I hope you can join us. And with that, I bid you a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.